Uh, I hereby declare open the 10th meeting of the 36th session of the Human Rights Council. We shall now proceed with the biennial panel discussion on unilateral coercive measures and human rights convened pursuant to Human Rights Council Resolution 27-21, its corrigendum and Resolution 34-13. This year's discussion will focus on the theme resources and compensation necessary to promote accountability and reparation. It is my honor to welcome Ms. Peggy Hicks, Director of the Semantic Engagement, Special Procedures and Right to Development Division at the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights, who will deliver an opening statement. Let me also welcome His Excellency Ambassador Jorge Valero, permanent representative of the Bolivian Republic of Venezuela to the United Nations Office and other international organizations in Geneva, who will be moderating our discussion today. Our distinguished panelists are Mr. Idris Jazairi, Special Rapporteur on the Negative Impact of Unilateral Course of Measures on the Enjoyment of Human Rights, Ms. Alena Duhan, Vice Rector and Head of the International Law Department, International Univer University Mitsu, Minsk, Belarus. Mr. Jean Digler, Member of the Human Rights Council Advisory Committee. And Mr. Alfred de Zayes, Independent Expert on the Promotion of a Democratic and Equitable International Order. Excellencies, before we proceed, let me remind you that delegations wishing to register on behalf of regional and other groups are asked to do so directly at the list of speakers' counter, instead of pressing the button. Their names will be moved to the beginning of the list. I would now like to ask the Secretariat to activate the electronic system for inscription on the list of speakers. Please activate. You have one minute to inscribe on the list, please. The provisional list will be shown on the screen shortly. The list of speakers will close in 15 minutes. Speakers are encouraged to intervene in the debate in an interactive way through comments and questions, taking into account and reflecting on the interventions of the panelists and other participants. The total time of the panel discussion being limited to three hours, all interventions should be no, no more than two minutes. I would like to underline the importance of observing this time limit in order to accommodate the maximum number of speakers. Those who have inscribed but will not be in a position to speak due to time constraints may still upload their statements in word format through the online inscription system for posting on the extranet of the Council. I now would like to invite Ms. Piggy Hicks, Director of the Semantic Engagement, Special Procedure and Right to Development Division, at the Office of the High Commissioner to deliver her opening statement. Ms. Higgs, you have the floor, ma'am. Thank you very much, Mr. Vice President, distinguished panelists and participants, colleagues and friends. Nearly 25 years ago, 171 nations gathered in Vienna for the World Conference on Human Rights. In that forum, they adopted the Vienna Declaration and Program of Action, which calls explicitly on states to, quote, refrain from any unilateral measure not in accordance with international law and the Charter of the United Nations that creates obstacles to trade relations among states and impedes the full realization of human rights, in particular the rights of everyone to a standard of living adequate for their health and well-being, including food and medical care, housing, and the necessary social services. Three years later, the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights identified the following human rights challenges often associated with economic sanctions imposed internationally, regionally, 
and unilaterally. They may lead to significant disruptions in the distribution of food, pharmaceuticals, and sanitation supplies, jeopardize the quality of food and the availability of drink, clean drinking water, interfere with the functioning of basic health and education systems, and undermine the right to work. They argued for the need to inject a human rights dimension into deliberations on this issue and concluded that more attention should be paid to the impact of these measures on groups in vulnerable situations. In a 2012 thematic study, the Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Human Rights re reiterated these concerns and recommended that all member states avoid the application of any coercive measures that have negative effects on human rights, particularly on the most vulnerable. That report emphasized that even carefully targeted sanctions imposed to end gross human rights violations must be subject to stringent conditions. In particular, they must be imposed no longer than necessary, they must be proportional, and they must be subject to appropriate human rights safeguards, including human rights impact assessments and monitoring conducted by independent experts. As a bottom line, the positive impact that sanctions impose with the objective of protecting human rights can be reasonably expected to have must outweigh the negative impact, taking into account the views of the population suffering under the human rights violations that gave rise to the sanctions and the impact on the most vulnerable parts of society. Yet, despite these recommendations, we see repeatedly that unilateral coercive measures are being imposed without full consideration for their human rights impact and without proper assessment, monitoring, and remedy. So since the Committee on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights made its assessment, we have seen many times that sanctions which do not provide for clear exemptions for the purchase and payment of food or medical supplies lead to the violations of the rights to food, to water, to health, and ultimately to the right to life. In addition, although typically sanctions do not target specific population groups, the poor and the groups in vulnerable situations, including women, older persons, and children, are usually the ones who suffer the most because of denial of access to life-saving equipment and medications and basic food products. Recently, for example, sanctions on Sudan allowed for the purchase of medical supplies but failed to allow for their payment. This omission was fortunately resolved through the assistance of the Special Rapporteur on the negative impact of unilateral coercive measures on the enjoyment of human rights and on Sudan. So thank you for that intervention, and we'll, I'm sure we'll hear more. At the individual level, par people targeted by sanctions often have no form of review or redress, and coercive measures can last for years, even if they are unjustified. Mr. Vice President, today's panel will allow this Council to give further consideration to different aspects of the relationship between human rights and unilateral coercive measures, focusing in particular on the resources necessary to promote accountability and reparations. Several documents shed light on the related questions, including contributions to the first Council panel event, which took place two years ago. The Advisory Committee on the Human Rights Council in 2015 discussed po potential mechanisms to assess the negative impact of unilateral coercive measures and to promote accountability. These are the issues that are difficult to resolve, but we hope that the panel can focus on some of the following questions in this discussion today, keeping in mind the avoidance of coercive measures that result in adverse human rights consequences. First. How can sanctions be designed so that they do not render already vulnerable parts of the population more vulnerable? Second, what are the safeguards that can be put in place when such measures are imposed? Third, what review and monitoring can take place to assess the impact of measures on human rights and take immediate remedial measures when sanctions have negative consequences, including those that may have been unforeseen? And finally, how can accountability and reparation be framed in this context? I look forward to hearing the panel members unpack these issues for us today and uh, to hearing their expertise on these issues. Thank you for being with us. I trust that this panel will help us chart a way forward on how to address the adverse impacts of human rights caused by unilateral coercive measures and uh, bring us to more fruitful discussions on these important issues. Thank you. Thank you very much. I will now give the floor to His Excellency Ambassador Valero, Permanent Representative of Venezuela, to moderate the panel discussion. You have the floor, Ambassador. 
Gracias, vicepresidente. Su excelencia, embajador Ramadán. Es un honor para mí participar como moderador en este panel bienal sobre las medidas coercitivas unilaterales y los derechos humanos. El segundo de esta naturaleza que celebramos en el Consejo de Derechos Humanos. Dable recordar que en la cumbre de Margarita, Venezuela, los jefes de Estado y de gobierno del MNOAL expresaron su condena a la promulgación y aplicación de medidas coercitivas unilaterales contra los países en desarrollo en contravención de la Carta de las Naciones Unidas y el Derecho Internacional. Estas medidas violan los agrosantos principios universales de la no intervención, del derecho a la libre determinación y a la independencia de los Estados que son objeto de estas nefastas prácticas. En esa oportunidad, nuestras autoridades reiteraron su decisión de denunciar y exigir la anulación de dichas medidas que afectan los derechos humanos e impiden el pleno desarrollo económico y social de los pueblos del sur. Es en este contexto de conformidad con la resolución 2721 de este Consejo que hemos dado inicio a la celebración de este panel bienal sobre las medidas coercitivas unilaterales y los derechos humanos, el cual precisamente se centrará en los recursos y la compensación necesarios para promover la rendición de cuentas y las reparaciones en ese contexto. Esperamos tener un fructífero y constructivo diálogo en el marco de esta importante iniciativa impulsada por el movimiento de países no alineados en la continuación de los esfuerzos por resaltar el impacto negativo de las medidas coercitivas unilaterales en el disfrute de todos los derechos humanos incluido el derecho al desarrollo. Así como en las relaciones internacionales, el comercio, la inversión y la cooperación, además de los desproporcionados efectos que produce en los sectores más pobres y vulnerables de los países en desarrollo sometidos a las mismas. Sin más palabras, procedo entonces a dar la palabra a los distinguidos panelistas, cada uno de los cuales tendrá siete minutos para realizar sus exposiciones. Y comenzaremos con el señor Idris Yazairi, relator especial sobre el impacto negativo de las medidas coercitivas unilaterales en el disfruto de los derechos humanos. Y tiene usted la palabra, distinguido señor relator. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I welcome the initiative of holding this biennial panel discussion on unilateral coercive measures and human rights, focusing on the issue of resources and compensation necessary to promote accountability and reparations. This is an opportunity to identify possible further action to be taken on this issue by the Human Rights Council and the General Assembly. The basic principle I advocate is that we focus on prevention, if it's possible. If, but if it isn't, then uh, unilateral sanctions that entail a negative impact on human rights should open the right to remedy, and that should be available for all and protected, be it at the national, regional, or international level. The unavailability of such mechanisms would contravene some of the basic obligations enshrined in most human rights treaties. There does indeed exist a range of different legal mechanisms offering, a, offering a potential avenues. Let me briefly uh, mention some of them. At the interstate level, there are two mechanisms. One, of course, is the international Uh, court uh, of justice that has taken a position on a particular case in 86 where he said it was military and paramilitary activities in and against Nicaragua. The court's ruling suggested that the freedom to impose measures restricting trade with a targeted country, uh, state is acceptable but it's circumscribed to situations where such measures would not involve a violation of existing treaty obligations. This leaves the courts much to decide upon as regards unilateral coercive measures. Are they legal or not under public international law? 
Do they comply or not with human rights governance to which the targeting state is a party? Do, they, do the repeated resolutions of the General Assembly since 1974 condemning recourse to unilateral coercive measures create some form of custom law, customary law or not? The ICJ could be requested to provide an, an advisory opinion on the legality or otherwise of UCMs. There would probably be a high measure of support in the General Assembly for, request, for a request to the ICJ on this matter. Second option, the WTO, to the extent that unilateral coercive measures imposed by a World Trade Organization member state against another state may arguably entail violations of the obligations set forth in the WTO agreement. It appears prima facie that recourse to the WTO dispute settlement body could be an option for a WTO member state faced with international sanctions. This is without prejudice to the fact that the targeting state would probably invoke security exceptions set out in Article 21 of the GATT as a defense and a justification for its non-application of relevant WTO rules. The discussion would then hinge on the admissibility of invoking Article 21, which would have to be based on a case-by-case analysis. Now, mechanisms that are directly affected to uh, uh, address to individuals and entities. At the domestic level, they're few and far between. There has been a, a case in the UK where such a, a decision was uh, annulled. But the, the, this is a, a very rare exception. <coughs> uh, at the regional, uh, there are also regional mechanisms, whether under the EU or under the Council of Europe. Sanctions applied by the EU are subject to full judicial review before the EU courts in Luxembourg. These courts have developed over time a rich jurisprudence of cases brought by individuals or entities subject to restrictive measures. In some cases, the applicants have actually obtained delisting, even if the proportion of successful cases remains very low. What remains unsettled is whether individuals or entities found to have been unlawfully targeted could be awarded damages by the court. Under EU law, private parties may bring action for damages before the General Court, alleging a non-contractual liability of the EU, but no damages when allocated were more than symbolic. Thus, in one single case so far before the EU, uh, EU Court, a claimant unlawfully targeted by EU sanctions was granted very modest damages. The European Court of Human Rights in Strasbourg under the Council of Europe is also competent to adjudicate on cases brought by individuals or legal entities for violations of the Convention for the Protection of Human Rights and Fundamental Freedoms. But in general, the cases where uh, uh, the, the the decisions are not are very few and they are limited to the uh, jurisdiction, uh, the territorial jurisdiction of the country is concerned. What about the human rights bodies of the United Nations? Uh, first and foremost, we have the treaty-based human rights bodies. Uh, some of these mechanisms are a priori relevant to the situation of persons whose human rights have been infringed by sanctions. However, such mechanisms are unavailable when states that impose the sanctions are not a party to the covenant. Committees established under the covenants may consider individual communications alleging violations of any of the rights set forth in the uh, covenant concerned. Whether individuals affected by sanctions who are residing in the targeted country and thus are arguably not subject to the jurisdiction of the source state, uh, whether they have a standing to initiate these proceedings remains a moot point. 
In that respect, I have argued for targeting state accountability and liability for damages. Human rights treaties may, in principle, impose on state parties obligations, not only when they adopt measures applicable on their own territory, but also extraterritorial obligations, insofar as the state can influence situations located abroad. As regards remedies and redress proper, although a committee may render a decision as to remedial action to be taken by the state, such as compensation to the victims, their decisions are not legally binding on the targeting state. Complaints based on violations of human rights through the imposition of UCMs may arguably also be submitted to the special procedures of the Human Rights Council or to the Human Rights Council itself. Last remark on Compensation Commission, if there's nothing else uh, on the horizon, there's a possibility of uh, resorting to a form of uh, Compensation Commission uh, which have been established by the UN in the past. Such a Compensation Commission could be set up either under the Security Council or alternatively be established by means of a multilateral convention. States which have imposed UCMs on other states could be called upon to contribute financially to such a commission. Uh, this idea of a compensation commission was, got a lot of support this morning and might therefore need to be further investigated. I thank you, Mr. Moderator. Muchas gracias, distinguido relator especial, quien nos, ha, nos invita a que nos concentremos en el examen de la reparación y los diferentes mecanismos que existen. Nos propone la posibilidad de que los Estados asuman la responsabilidad por la reparación y nos sugiere una idea muy interesante, cuál es la creación de una comisión de indemnizaciones y de reparación. Vamos ahora a darle la palabra a la distinguida doctora Alena Duan, vicerectora y jefe del Departamento del Derecho Internacional de la Universidad Internacional Mitso, Minsk, Bielorrusia. Tiene usted la palabra, distinguida ponente. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. As rightly noted in the human rights documents, unilateral coercive measures impact is very similar to those of other threats to the international peace and security. It definitely has a very high negative destabilizing effect. Negative effect on the progress of the peaceful social and economic development of all peoples. The Human Rights Council has repeatedly called for all states to stop adopting, maintaining or implementing unilateral coercive measures not in accordance with international law. However, it has never said what are the unilateral coercive measures which are not in accordance with international law. Eventually, we have started to discuss resources and means necessary to promote accountability and reparation, and it's definitely a great step forward. In his report in 2016, the UN Special Report on Negative Impact of Unilateral Coercive Measures over Enjoyment of Human Rights already proposed a number of mechanisms as he did now. However, if we speak about responses to the application of the unilateral coercive measures, it seems necessary to pay attention not only to the mechanism of measures applied to state or applied to individuals or legal entities, but also to the consequences and the purposes of this activity. I would insist that it's very important to pay attention not only to the immediate responses, but much more to the long-term ones. If we speak about immediate responses to measures taken against states, it's necessary first to stop adopting, maintaining or implementing unilateral coercive measures not in accordance with international law as called for by the Human Rights Council in reality. Second, take into account that quite a lot of cases of application of pressure over states comes from the situation when states can't agree about the facts. It's necessary to act or reactivate the use of the fact-finding mechanisms existing within the United Nations. It's also necessary to use actively human rights special procedures as well as procedures already existing within the human rights mechanisms. 
as concerns immediate responses against unilateral coercive measures targeting individuals or legal entities. The first place shall be taken by the domestic courts. An individual or legal entity shall have a right to turn to the domestic courts either of the habitual residence or registration or the court of targeting states. This mechanism will provide a possibility to assess legality of the activity of the targeted individual and decide on the criminal or administrative penalty if he is recognized guilty. However, if a person is recognized non-guilty, any measures applied shall be lifted immediately. In both situations, targeted natural or legal entity shall stand trial to be punished for illegal activity if it's proven that there was an illegal activity or recognized non-guilty with the observance of all procedural guarantees. The individual or legal entity shall definitely have the possibility to apply to other international mechanisms, already existing ones, both at the universal and at the regional level. However, if, if we intend not only to face consequences, but also to prevent violations from happening, we need to focus much more on the long-term long solutions. Long-term responses to any unilateral coercive measures shall inevitably include drafting and fixing the definition of unilateral coercive measures, as well as criteria upon which activity can be viewed as an illegal one. That means can be viewed as a unilateral coercive measures. It's impossible to speak about accountability and compensation for activity which is not qualified as illegal. Ex absence of definition opened the way for numerous misuses. Therefore, if the means of pressure applied by a state are legal under international law, they do not constitute unilateral coercive measures and therefore can't be a ground for accountability and reparations. Vice versa. If a state or IGO applies measures which are illegal, which the, are the unilateral coercive measures, and a state or IGO shall be held responsible, and here we will speak about reparations. Secondly, it is impossible to set forth an obligation to stop adopting, maintaining, or implementing unilateral coercive measures at the higher level, for example, at the resolution of the UN General Assembly. Thirdly, when we speak about measures or means of pressure applied by one state to another, it often happens in the situation of discrepancies or disputes between these states. Therefore, it is necessary to use much more actively the mechanism for peaceful settlement of international disputes in all possible forms, including, for example, the WTO dispute settlement body when we speak about economic sanctions. If we speak about resources necessary to promote accountability and reparation, we shan't mean only financial or any other economic means. All immediate mechanisms mentioned in the presentation provide for the means of compensation as well as control over their observance one way or another. The problem, however, will hardly disappear if we do only this. If we seek to switch from compensating in restricted cases to preventive approach, it's necessary to change the system as a whole. Meanwhile, neither the registration of steps which may be or may not be the unilateral coercive measures, nor the establishment of additional quasi-judicial board which will qualify measures as unilateral coercive measures or anything else, nor the compensation commission by itself will solve the problem. It's necessary first to define the subject of our discussion what the unilateral coercive measures are. Until we do it, we will stay much more in the sphere of philosophy rather than the sphere of law. In this case, we will be unable to, to demand any legal means. As a starting point, I would propose here a definition. For example, the unilateral coercive measures are measures applied by states, groups of states, or regional organizations without or beyond authorization of the UN Security Council to states, individuals or entities in order to change a policy or behavior of a directly or indirectly targeted state if these measures can't undoubtedly be qualified as not violating any international obligations of the applying state or organization or its wrongfulness is not excluded under general international law. Secondly, 
It's necessary to amend the whole system of application of targeted sanctions to guarantee the due process. In particular, criminal or administrative process shall be started immediately by the targeting state with simultaneous submission of information to the UN Security Council or the European Council in the case of regional action. In this case, targeted sanctions shall be lifted immediately if a person is recognized unguilty. However, if a person is recognized guilty, he will face the criminal responsibility. In both cases, we won't need any targeted sanctions anymore. Thirdly, if the unilateral coercive measures are already applied, the targeted state, natural or legal entity shall be able to apply to above-mentioned bodies, both, bodies, both national or international, for immediate responses and compensation. Corresponded bodies will need to define whether measures resulted, resulted from the alleged infringement of rights are the unilateral coercive measures. However, in this case, we will need a definition, for example, set forth in the UNC General Assembly Resolution. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, doctora, por su interesante exposición en la que apreciamos que uno de los aspectos centrales de su intervención consiste en precisar que hay una falta de definición sobre estas medidas coercitivas unilaterales que son las que abren el escape para su aplicación y propone una definición sobre estas medidas coercitivas que pueden servir de referencia, eso creo, para la adopción de resoluciones de los órganos pertinentes de las Naciones Unidas. Vamos ahora a darle la palabra al distinguido señor Jan Ziegler, quien es miembro del Comité Asesor del Consejo de Derechos Humanos. Señor Vicepresidente del Consejo, Excelencias, Mesdames, Messieurs, je vais faire d'abord une remarque préliminaire qui, d'abord, il me semble évident ce que Mme X a dit tout à l'heure, les sanctions unilatérales, quelles qu'elles soient, contre le Qatar, contre Cuba, contre l'Union soviétique, contre le Zimbabwe, violent en permanence les droits économiques, sociaux et culturels. C'est aussi la conviction que le comité, à travers ses comités consultatifs du Conseil des droits de l'homme, dont je suis le vice-président, a la même conviction à travers ses recherches, à travers le rapport qu'il a établi pour le Conseil. Toujours, je le répète sans exception, il y a violation pour la population victime du pays boycotté, mis sous sanction, de violation de ses droits économiques, sociaux et culturels, et bien sûr de son droit au développement autonome. Notre comité s'est surtout préoccupé de savoir comment fonctionnent les sanctions unilatérales, comment elles elle s'articule techniquement. Et nous avons trouvé, nous l'avons dit dans notre rapport, que les sanctions agissent sur trois niveaux en permanence, contre quel que soit le pays contre lequel elles, elles se mettent en œuvre. D'abord, il y a l'attaque contre les relations extérieures du pays victime, blocus de Cuba, etc., etc., l'attaque contre les relations extérieures. Ensuite, il y a interférence du pays qui utilise ces sanctions dans le, la politique intérieure, économique, sociale, politique intérieure du pays victime. Et troisièmement, il y a déclenchement chaque fois d'une conférence, d'une campagne de presse internationale qui accompagne ces sanctions, qui justifie le pays, le gouvernement, qui déclare les sanctions, les met en œuvre et qui en même temps, délégitime évidemment le pays agresseur. C'est les trois niveaux que nous avons constatés dans n'importe quel cas examiné. Et ces cas, comme vous le savez, sont très nombreux, sont diverses et touchent des victimes différentes. Pour articuler ces trois niveaux, cette triple arme euh, de la sanction, je prends un exemple, qui est un exemple d'actualité, celui du Venezuela. Celui du Venezuela. Vous savez que, d'abord au premier niveau, relations extérieures, le président Trump a pris un exécutif ordre euh, le 24 août qui exclut pratiquement le Venezuela du marché des capitaux internationaux, c'est-à-dire qui interdit soit aux instituts financiers américains, soit aux instituts étrangers qui agissent domiciliés sur le sol américain, d'accepter 
d'acheter des obligations du gouvernement ou de la société pétrolière, empêche en même temps la filiale de la société pétrolière qui raffine et qui distribue euh, le pétrole raffiné, qui appartient à les propriétés vénézuéliennes, de rapatrier au Venezuela ses, euh, ses profits. C'est euh, ce décret que j'ai devant moi, qui est très explicite, qui est très détaillé, très clair, est évidemment un coup très très dur pour le Venezuela, puisque le Venezuela est un pays endetté, surendetté, que la prochaine tranche d'amortissement est pourtant un mois, 2,9 milliards à en rembourser, que le Venezuela a prévu de rembourser en vendant une partie de l'or de sa Banque nationale, elle ne peut plus le faire du fait de ce blocus des mouvements euh, financiers. En ce qui concerne le deuxième niveau, euh, là, la situation est plus délicate. Je peux simplement dire que notre comité a reçu de la mission permanente la République bolivarienne du Venezuela des trois rapports très détaillés, le dernier à nous dernier, très détaillé, très factuel, très concret, qui attestent, selon ce document, qui attestent l'intervention d'acteurs extérieurs dans le conflit interne. Je dis tout de suite que personnellement, je trouve une tragédie totale, totale, les morts, 125 morts depuis avril dernier jusqu'au début août, la moitié à peu près des manifestants, l'autre moitié des policiers, des hommes, des soldats, etc. Une tragédie humaine qui, évidemment, faut, faudrait qu'elle cesse euh, tout de suite et qui préoccupe tout le monde. À ce deuxième niveau, je ne peux pas, moi, personnellement ou au nom du comité, faire un jugement. Je peux simplement dire ce que la mission du Venezuela nous a communiqué, mais qui me semble assez convaincant. D'une part, 80% du commerce interne du Venezuela, des services, euh, biens de consommation, etc., etc., est entre les mains des privés et souvent entre les mains des sociétés multinationales qui organisent, selon ce document, la pénurie en stockant les biens, en ne pas mettant sur le marché, en créant la pénurie artificiellement. Ensuite, plusieurs mouvements d'opposition seraient, selon ce document, soutenus financièrement, politiquement aussi, par une puissance étrangère, ici des instances des États-Unis. Des États Là, je ne peux pas juger non plus, mais il y a des indices. 2002, il y a eu un coup d'État contre le président Chavez, qui a duré quatre jours. Ensuite, le peuple a réclamé le retour du président Chavez. Le président Chavez est revenu à, 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 à Miraflores, au palais présidentiel. Et les chefs des putschistes, c'est les mêmes, Enrique Cabriles, Leopoldo Lopez, etc., et d'autres, sont les mêmes qui étaient impliqués dans ce putsch et qui sont de nouveau maintenant impliqués dans le conflit violent qui se déroule, hélas, aujourd'hui au Venezuela. Le troisième et dernier troisième niveau, c'est la campagne de presse. Je ne sais pas si vous lisez la presse suisse, ce n'est pas absolument nécessaire. La presse française ou allemande, c'est incroyable ce qu'on lit actuellement dans les journaux. Incroyable. Maduro, dictateur, euh, état de droit liquidé au Venezuela, plus de démocratie au Venezuela, etc. Une sorte de d'attaque euh, massive, diffamatoire contre un pays membre des Nations Unies et du Conseil des droits de l'homme. Alors, M. Maduro a été élu en 2013, légitimement contesté par personne, président du Venezuela. Il vient de, de faire élire une constitution, une assemblée constituante, ce qui est le droit de n'importe quel gouvernement du monde. Il serait dictateur si jamais il ne soumettait pas au pays le texte final de la Constitution, s'il n'avait pas une votation populaire pour ou contre de cette Constitution. Mais cette campagne diffamatoire, je le dis comme citoyen de Genève, euh, est absolument extraordinaire. Elle a deux buts, je le répète, légitimer les sanctions unilatérales et deuxièmement, délégitimer un gouvernement d'un État souverain. Ça, c'est les trois niveaux que nous avons identifiés où jouent les, euh, les, euh, les sanctions unilatérales. 
Si Monsieur le modérateur me permet, je voudrais faire une remarque personnelle. Il y a des choses tout à fait étranges. Euh, ici, dans cette maison, à 100 mètres d'ici, il y a la Bibliothèque des Nations Unies, qui est une bibliothèque formidable, qui est liée à la Bibliothèque du Congrès américain. Ce que je viens de décrire pour le Venezuela, c'est passé exactement la même chose, pratiquement la même chose, il y a 50 ans, contre l'unité populaire, le gouvernement démocratique m'a élu, de M. Salvador Allende, qui a abouti le 11 septembre 1973, comme vous le savez, à la mort du président et au coup d'État fasciste du général Pinochet. Or, les États-Unis d'Amérique sont une grande et vivante démocratie que j'admire beaucoup. 22 citoyens américains sont morts dans le coup d'État chilien et le Sénat s'est saisi du dossier. Et pendant 18 mois, le Foreign Relations Committee du Sénat américain, en toute indépendance, avec des questions dures, avec une volonté d'enquête impitoyable, a interrogé M. Kissinger et a interrogé chacune des 40 multinationales, notamment d'origine américaine, qui ont, été qui ont été les instruments de l'attaque contre le Chili populaire aux trois niveaux que je viens de le dire. Le résultat sont douze volumes qui sont à voir, à emprunter ici à 100 mètres de la, dans la bibliothèque des Nations Unies. Exactement la même stratégie que les, les États-Unis ont appliquée et qui a été dénoncé par le propre Sénat, par le sénateur Church notamment, des États-Unis, depuis maintenant 50 ans dans plusieurs endroits du monde. Il est donc, je conclue, heureux qu'avec autant d'énergie, le Haut Commissariat des droits de l'homme, le Conseil des droits de l'homme, s'attache à soumettre un régime normatif strict sur les réparations, etc., etc., notamment la création que M. Tajiri a évoquée tout à l'heure, et je salue son travail remarquable comme rapporteur spécial, d'une commission, d'une commission qui serait détentrice de ces normativités normales qui doit mettre fin, une fois pour toutes, aux sanctions unilatérales qu'un État peut librement décider d'infliger à un autre. Je vous remercie. Muchas gracias, eh, distinguido doctor Sigler, miembro del comité asesor, quien ha subrayado que las medidas coercitivas unilaterales, sin excepción, afectan los derechos humanos. Y ya en este caso, permítame retornar a mi condición de representante permanente de Venezuela, eh, en cuyo caso quiero agradecerle al distinguido doctor Sigler por haber hecho referencia con tan abundante información al caso Venezuela, en donde, como él lo ha explicado, se demuestra que la campaña internacional que se desarrolla contra mi país está destinada a justificar la aplicación de medidas unilaterales que están afectando, sin duda alguna, la calidad de vida de nuestra gente. Ahora quisiera darle la palabra al distinguido doctor Alfred de Sayas, quien es experto independiente sobre la promoción de un orden internacional democrático y equitativo. Muchas gracias, embajador Valero. Distinguished chair, excellencies, colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, a democratic and equitable international order is one in which people are freely able to determine their political status, able to pursue their economic, social and cultural development with dignity, where peoples and nations have sovereignty over their natural, natural resources uh, where individuals are not harmed by power hierarchies, the inequitable distribution of wealth and globalization. The imposition of unilateral coercive measures threaten the realization of a democratic and equitable international order because, as I noted already in my 2013 report to the General Assembly, these measures have been shown to cause immense harm to the world's most vulnerable populations while granting disproportionate leverage to the powerful. 
as we ourselves can attest, in an interconnected and unsteady world, the unilateral actions of a single state can negatively impact the realization of rights across the globe. The fundamental rights to life, health, education, sustenance, clean water, and an adequate standard of living are impinged when measures taken by one nation restrict access to food, medicine, sanitation, supplies, and essential goods in and outside of that nation. The ability of states to fulfill their economic, social, and cultural rights obligations is hampered when unilateral actions disturb the provision of public services or the maintenance of vital infrastructure. Time and again, human rights and humanitarian actors have raised concern about the particular harms unilateral measures have inflicted on historically marginalized groups. This is why such measures have been condemned by a majority of states on a regular basis and in a variety of international fora. Consider the fact that 23 resolutions of the General Assembly have denounced as illegal the unilateral United States embargo or blockade of Cuba. Moreover, the contributory nature of unilateral coercive nature, uh, measures in ongoing human rights situations before this very Council, including those related to the supply of weapons to armed groups, the blockage of Gaza, and the targeted killings of non-state actors, do touch the United Nations' fundamental pillar of international peace and security. International stakeholders, academics, and uh, civil society have pointed out that the imposition of unilateral course of measures runs contrary to foundational General Assembly resolutions, most notably Resolution 2625 regarding friendly relations between states. In that resolution, the General Assembly emphasizes that, quote, no state may use or encourage the use of economic, political, or any other type of measure to coerce another state in order to obtain from it the subordination of the exercise of its sovereign rights or to secure from it advantages of any kind, unquote. Our unifying goal of friendly relations and the obligation to avoid interference in the internal affairs of other member states are, together, crucial preconditions for the peaceful coexistence of nations. While international law is continually developing and is known to have legal gray areas, the international law applicable to coercive measures is remarkably clear. Article 41 of the UN Charter may explain that the Security Council is granted the singular authority to impose sanctions and even then only provided it has made a finding under Article 39 of the Charter that international peace and security have been jeopardized. Recognizing that even multilateral sanctions pose risks to the enjoyment of human rights by all people, I endorse the proposal of Professor Mark Bossoit when he suggested in his report to the Subcommission on the Promotion and Protection of Human Rights that coercive measures must be limited in time should not affect the innocent population, should not aggravate imbalances in income distribution, nor generate illegal and unethical business practices. Moreover, as with any state policy, the asserted intention of a state should not be the only measure of its value. Sanctions regimes must be proved to be proportionate. They must be periodically monitored and terminated when it becomes apparent that they are ineffective or worse, result in grave human rights violations. It is evident that an embargo on uh, medicine can directly lead to the loss of life, therefore a violation of Article 6 of the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Indeed, multilateral sanctions were implemented successfully in the fight against colonialism, racism, and apartheid in southern Africa. Similarly, a multilaterally agreed we weapons embargo may be both legal and effective when appropriately aimed at promoting peace and promoting diplomatic solutions to violence. 
With this in mind, in situations of conflict, weapons embargoes would therefore be imposed on all warring parties while, at the same time, the international community actively works toward negotiations and a return to peace in good faith. I applaud the Special Rapporteur on unilateral coercive measures, Idris Yazairi, and many other rapporteurs who have already addressed issues of unilateral coercive measures. I applaud academics and members of civil society organizations who have consistently called on states to assess the human rights harms caused by unilateral regimes. I recommend that such harms be further exposed in the context of the Council's special procedures. They should be raised in the treaty body's individual complaints mechanisms of the uh, Human uh, Rights Committee of the Committee on Economic and Social uh, Rights and debated in the context of the uh, Universal Periodic Review. In addition, the as of yet underutilized interstate complaints procedure of the treaty bodies, Article 41 of the Covenant on Civil and Political Rights, may prove useful in cases where doing so could facilitate negotiation and the friendly settlement of disputes. Finally, the accountability framework for harms caused by unilateral course of measures must be developed. Where sanctions have resulted in famine, conflict, or mass migration, the obligation to account for and repair the violation naturally follows. Frustratingly, however, the political will to create and enforce this necessary framework remains lacking. Cognizant of this troublesome lacuna, I call on member states of the Human Rights Council to collaborate towards the development of mechanisms which will guarantee recourse and reparations for communities that suffer as a result of coercive actions taken by individual states. In a globalized world, unchecked coercive measures will leave countless collateral victims. The counter approach to, of multilateralism, both in evaluating the legality and the impact of sanctions, is, in my opinion, a more democratic and equitable way forward. Allow me to recall my 2013, or rather, first, the 2014 workshop uh, hosted by the Office of the High Commissioner for Human Rights and my 2013 report to the Council that reports thereon. In that uh, workshop, uh, the uh, participants uh, uh, rejected unilateral uh, measures uh, and referred to uh, the Vienna Declaration of, and Program of Action and to uh, the uh, general comment number eight of the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights, which specifically condemn unilateral uh, coercive measures because of the serious negative uh, impacts on the human rights of the peoples concerned. I thank you. Muchas gracias, eh, Dr. Alfred Sayas, que nos ha puntualizado que las medidas coercitivas unilaterales dan más poder a los poderosos y atentan en contra de los derechos humanos. Nos ha dicho también que estas medidas han sido particularmente condenadas en los casos de Cuba y Gaza porque han sido rechazadas por los órganos pertinentes de las Naciones Unidas, que están reñidas estas medidas con las resoluciones básicas, resoluciones fundamentales adoptadas por la Asamblea General. Ahora quisiera de darle, pasarle la palabra a quien corresponde en esta ocasión, seguir dirigiendo nuestro debate, que es el distinguido el vicepresidente, embajador Arm Ramadan. Thank you very much, moderator. Uh, distinguished delegates, uh, we will proceed now with the first segment of the list of speakers. And let me remind you that all interventions from the floor are limited to two minutes, and that the list of speakers is now closed. I now give the floor to the distinguished representative of Pakistan, who would be speaking on behalf of the OIC. You have the floor, sir. Mr. President, 
On behalf of OIC, we welcome the holding of this biennial panel discussion. This is an important subject before, because, because of such measures adversely affect the, uh, their impact on human rights. We are deeply alarmed by disproportionate and discriminate human costs of unilateral sanctions and their negative effects on the civilian population of the targeted states, in particular those most vulnerable women and children, often the unintended but eventual targets. Surely hitting the weakest cannot be a noble objective. Equally, unilateral coercive measures become, became, become tools in the hands of the powerful and prevent the full realization of economic and social development of nations while also affecting the full realization of human rights. They also impinge on effective implementation of the Declaration on the Right to Development. The, o the OIC states are of the view that remedies, compensations and redress at the United ne Nations level should be provided to those who have been affected and their rights have been violated by unilateral measures. We would like the panelists to elaborate on what in their view are the possible mechanisms to ensure the availability of efficient remedies and redress for victims of unilateral coercive measures, especially when these measures have a direct impact on the core basis necessities of a large population, including water, health, children's education, and most of all, seriously undermine the human dignity. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks to you. Uh, next is Tunisia on behalf of the African group. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I have the honor to deliver this statement on behalf of the African group. The African group welcomes the holding of this panel discussion on the neutral coercive measures and the human rights in accordance with the Human Rights Council Resolution 27-21, its corrigendum and resolution 34-13 on the thema resource and compensation necessary to promote accountability and reparations. We would like to thank the Office, the Office of the High Commissioner for the opening remarks and the panelists for their comprehensive presentation and valuable contributions. Imposing unilateral coercive measures by some states against some other states, especially developing and, and least developed countries, are contrary to the international law and norms and have adverse impacts to the enjoyment of the human rights. The Vienna Declaration and Program of Actions calls European states to refrain from any unilateral measures not in accordance with international law and charter of the United Nations that creates obstacles to trade relations among states and impedes the full realizations of the human rights set forth in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and International Human Rights Instruments. The African group believes that it is essential for the states that if affected by unilateral coercive measures to be compensated at the international level and we would like to ask the panelists what is the appropriate and effective me mechanism in their views to promote accountability and reparations to the victims of the unilateral coercive measures. Thank you. I thank the delegation of Tunisia and I now give the floor to Egypt speaking on behalf of the Arab group. Shukran Sayyid Nabi Rais. Ulki has a man near Batan and Magmoa to do an ad of Figamat to do Larabi. To Rahib and Magmoa Arabia, the Halakot and the Kosh was said in Mutahadina Hilania, what to Skirum Ala Rudal Kayam and Etiko de Muha. In the Igraat al Uhadia Kosria to Sodr Hizma Kabira and Hukukul Insane, Fikotaat al Saha, Wal Talim, Wal Nakl, Wal Hadamet, Wal Tanmir. What to Ayk and Fiz it is a meta dual al Atrof, and that he Nasat Alaiha and Etafakiat was Sukuka Dolia. What to Ki Bekahil and Moana Ala Shara Hal Hashaf in Muktama, can Nisa or Atfal or Kibar Sin. كما يترتب عليها معاناة إضافية للطبقات الاقتصادية والاجتماعية الأضعف لقد تحملت دول العالم مسؤولية تحقيق أهداف التنمية المستدامة بحلول العام 2030 للارتقاء بحزمة الحقوق والخدمات التي ينعم بها الإنسان والتي تهدف إلى ما هو أبعد من ذلك من حماية للبيئة والأحياء وتعهدت بأنها لن تترك أحدا خلف الركب وبذلك تذكر المجموعة العربية الدول الأعضاء في منظومة الأمم المتحدة 
بالتزامتها في هذا المجال وتؤكد أن الإجراءات الأحادية القصرية هي من أهم ما يعارك الجهود التنمية المستدامة شكرا سيد نائب الرئيس I thank you and I now give the floor to Venezuela speaking on behalf of NAM. Gracias, señor presidente. Tengo el honor de hacer esta declaración en nombre del Movimiento de Países No Alineados. Damos la bienvenida a la celebración de este panel bienal. Señor presidente, las leyes que imponen medidas positivas unilaterales tienen un efecto extraterritorial no solo en los países destinatarios, sino también en terceros países. El MNOAL reconoce que las medidas coercitivas unilaterales en forma de sanciones económicas tienen implicaciones de gran alcance para los derechos humanos de la población de los estados objeto de estas medidas, afectando de manera desproporcionada las clases más pobres y vulnerables. Por lo tanto, reiteramos que la adopción de medidas coercitivas unilaterales por cualquier causa o consideración contra países en desarrollo es contraria al derecho internacional, al derecho de los derechos humanos y a los derechos básicos de los pueblos, como el derecho a la vida, el derecho a la salud y a la atención médica y el derecho a un nivel de vida adecuado. Señor Presidente, desafortunadamente a pesar de las resoluciones adoptadas por la Asamblea General, el Consejo de Derechos Humanos, la extinta Comisión de Derechos Humanos y en las conferencias de las Naciones Unidas y contraria a las normas de derecho internacional y de la Carta, se siguen promulgando medidas coercitivas unilaterales con todas sus consecuencias negativas para las actividades sociales y humanitarias y para el desarrollo económico y social de los países en desarrollo. Por lo tanto, el MNOAR subraya la necesidad de un mecanismo independiente del sistema de derechos humanos de las Naciones Unidas para que las víctimas de las medidas coercitivas unilaterales aborden la cuestión de los derechos a los recursos e indemnizaciones con miras a promover la rendición de cuentas y las reparaciones. El MNOAL también reconoce la importancia de la función de la Oficina del Alto Comisionado de Naciones Unidas para los Derechos Humanos para abordar los desafíos que plantean las medidas coercitivas unilaterales y su impacto negativo en los derechos humanos de los pueblos y las personas. Una versión completa de esta intervención ha sido consignada. Muchas gracias, señor Presidente. Thanks to you. Uh, now move to Cuba, speaking on behalf of LMG countries. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I have the honor to deliver this statement on behalf of 16 countries of the like-minded group. The full list is available on the extranet. We thank the distinguished panelists for their interventions today. We are unequivocally against the impositions of unilateral coer coercive measures, which are on most occasions being used to politically and economically target developing countries. These measures contravene existing international law, norms and principles go governing peaceful relations among states and the Charter of the United Nations. At the same time, they are a violation of the principle of states' sovereignty and political independence. Unilateral coercive measures produce an adverse impact on vital sectors and services, a situation that ushers in direct neg negative consequences on the enjoyment of human rights by the population in the affected countries. The imposition of these types of sanctions has clear negative consequences on the real realiz realization of the economic, social and cultural rights and is an important obstacle for the realization of the right to development. We urge states that have and continue to apply such laws and measures to refrain from promulgate, promulgating and applying them in conformity with their obligations under the Charter of the United Nations and international law. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you. Uh, next is China. Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. President, Mr. Renway 中方反对在安理会框架外采取单边强制措施，包括实施所谓长臂管辖，因为这在国际法上没有任何依据。
我们敦促有关国家停止采取损害联合国宪章权威、影响当事国经济社会发展、阻碍当事国民众享有人权的单边强制措施，切实减少和消除单边强制措施造成的负面影响。主席先生、副主席先生，中方鼓励单边强制措施，特别报告员继续就如何有效预防、减少和补救单边强制措施对人权的不利影响研提意见。也希望有关国家采取切实行动，支持报告员工作。中方还想请问促进民主和公平国际秩序独立专家，从您的授权角度看，单边强制措施对建立民主和公平的国际秩序有没有负面影响？如何消除这些影响，推动国际人权事业健康发展？谢谢副主席先生。Thank you. Uh, next is Bolivia. Jayaya, hermano vicepresidente. Agradecemos a los panelistas por sus importantes aportes a esta discusión tan necesaria y urgente dentro del Consejo de Derechos Humanos. Nos sumamos a la intervención realizada a nombre del NAM. Quiero recordar que la resolución de la Asamblea General 71-193 condena la inclusión de Estados miembros en listas unilaterales bajo falsos pretextos contrarios al derecho internacional y a la Carta de Naciones Unidas y considera que dichas listas son instrumentos de presión política o económica contra los Estados miembros, en particular contra los países en desarrollo motivo de doble necesidad para estudiar y profundizar la rendición de cuentas y la reparación. La ilegalidad de las medidas coercitivas unilaterales y sus efectos negativos es una realidad fáctica que de modo injusto, de desproporcionado y arbitrario afecta a niños, mujeres, personas con discapacidad, minorías, pueblos indígenas y campesinos, entre otros. Paradójicamente, a poblaciones que necesitan mayor atención de los Estados y de este Consejo. Por esta razón, consideramos que los efectos negativos presentes y futuros deberían ser considerados en las reparaciones a las víctimas por parte de los Estados que promuevan estas medidas. Consideramos importante centrar nuestra atención en las cuestiones de los recursos y la compensación y de acuerdo con los mandatos examinar y evaluar los diversos mecanismos de que disponen las víctimas de medidas coercitivas unilaterales. Con relación a la reparación a las víctimas por parte de los perpetradores, quisiéramos preguntar qué mecanismos serían los más pertinentes para promover la creación de un órgano que cumpla este rol a fin de evitar que su creación sea vetada por aquellos países que imponen estas medidas y niegan sus efectos nocivos a los derechos humanos. Gracias, vicepresidente. Thanks to you. Uh, next is the delegation of Iran. Mr. Vice President, at the outset we would like to thank distinguished panelists for presenting their valuable comments and views. Sanctions and unilateral coercive measures have adversely impacted the people both in targeted and origin communities, which resulted in violation of human rights. Although this right has arguably acknowledged in theory and principle in different documents, it has not been recognized by, by those who are responsible for these measures and frequently ignored or set aside in practice. It is upon the international community to consider the coercive measures as violation of human rights and ensure the accountability of those responsible for human rights violations. We are also deeply concerned about extraterritoriality of sanctions which disregards rules and jurisdiction of the states. As the special rapporteur has indicated in his latest report, same countries which apply unilateral sanctions with extraterritorial reach and effects are the same ones which generally oppose the extraterritorial character of the state obligations under the covenants, in particular International Covenant on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights. In this respect, it is noteworthy that the Committee on Economic, Social and Cultural Rights acknowledges that as a matter of law and logic, the, the imposition of sanctions on a country entails at least partial responsibility of targeting a state for the situation within the targeted country. 
In conclusion, we reiterate on the need to recognize the UCM as violation of human rights. In this vein, we ask the Council to consider the need for drafting of a declaration on abolition of unilateral coercive measures. I thank you. Thank you. Next is the delegation of Egypt. شكرا سيد نائب الرئيس يرحب وفد مصر بحلقه النقاش حول تدابير الاحاديه القصريه ويود ان يتقدم بالشكر للمتحدثين خلالها على العروض والمعلومات القيمه التي قدموها ونشدد في هذا السياق على ان التدابير الاحاديه القصريه تتعارض مع القانون الدولي والقانون الدولي لحقوق الانسان وميثاق الامم المتحده والمبادئ المنظمه للعلاقات السلميه بين الدول ونعرب عن بالغ القلق لاستمرار فرض الاجراءات الاحاديه القصريه كوسيلة للضغط السياسي أو الاقتصادي بما في ذلك من خلال استغلال السلع الأساسية مثل الغذاء والأدوية ونؤكد على موقفنا الرافض لاتخاذ تدابير أحادية من خلال سن قوانين تطبق خارج حدود الإقليمية للدول كما نشدد على حق كافة الشعوب في تقرير مصرها إننا نتابع عن كتب النقاش الجاري حول أهمية تطوير آلية مستقلة في إطار الأمم المتحدة تعنى بتعويض الضحايا وتعزيز المسألة وجبر الضرر التي ترتب على حرمان الشعوب من العديد من حقوقها الأساسية بسبب تلك الإجراءات واستحداث سجل مركزي لتجميع وتوثيق تلك التدابير ونشيد بالجهد الذي يبذله المقرر الخاص بأثر التدابير الأحادية القصرية على تمتع بحقوق الإنسان في هذا الشأن وختاما نحث الدول على الكف عن اعتماد أو تنفيذ أي إجراءات أحادية قصرية لسيما تلك التي تتجاوز الحدود الأقليمية وتضع عقبات أمام العلاقات التجارية بين الدول وتعيق تمتع الشعوب بحقوقها التي كفلتها المواثيق الدولية لسيما الحق في التنمية شكرا سيد نائب الرئيس Thank you. Next is Russian Federation. Благодарю вас господин вице-председатель Российская Федерация рассматривает проблематику односторонних принудительных мер как крайне важную и весьма деликатную Хорошо известно, что международные санкции являются одним из действенных инструментов в регулировании кризисных ситуаций, имеющихся в распоряжении мирового сообщества. Исходим из того, что исключительные прерогативы по их введению обладает только Совет Безопасности ООН. Принимая решение о введении ограничительных мер, необходимо учитывать, что они должны быть соразмерны угрозам международному миру и безопасности. Нельзя допускать, чтобы они становились механизмом коллективного наказания, негативно влияли на положение населения тех или иных стран. Нередки случаи введения под внешне благовидными предлогами односторонних принудительных мер в обход Совета Безопасности ООН. Считаем, что подобные действия приводят к подрыву системы международных отношений и торпедируют политико-дипломатические усилия по поиску выхода из кризисных ситуаций. Такие политически мотивированные действия нарушают основные свободы и права человека, общепринятые нормы международного права. Не случайно Всемирная конференция по правам человека 1993 года призвала государства воздерживаться от любых односторонних принудительных мер, которые создают препятствия для торговых отношений между государствами и затрудняют пользование правами человека. Убеждены, что задействование односторонних санкций для решения политических проблем – путь тупиковый и контрпродуктивный. Глобализация и глубокая взаимозависимость национальных экономик приводят к тому, что ограничения и попытки изоляции отдельных государств оборачиваются лишь потерями для тех, кто их вводит и препятствуют реализации прав и свобод граждан. Убеждены, что односторонние санкции негативно скажутся и на выполнении государствами стратегических целей развития на период до 2030 года. Призываем государства, которые принимают эти односторонние рестрикции, отказаться от этого противоправного внешнеполитического инструмента. Благодарю вас. Mi delegación agradece a los panelistas por sus exposiciones que dejan en claro, una vez más, que el uso de medidas coercitivas unilaterales contradice flagrantemente el derecho internacional y es una representación de fuerza que solo pueden aplicar ciertos países con mayor poder militar, político o económico sobre regímenes que no gozan de su beneplácito. Desde este punto de vista, las medidas coercitivas no son solamente unilaterales, sino unidireccionales, pues se aplican en un sentido único, de quien tiene más fuerza hacia otra parte menos fuerte, por lo que su aplicación es la consagración del abuso de poder a escala internacional, que es lo que históricamente ha intentado evitar el sistema multilateral que nos cobija. Hemos escuchado en esta sala intentos de justificación para el uso de las medidas coercitivas unilaterales, 
señalando que supuestamente benefician el goce de los derechos humanos y descalificando a quienes las critican. Consideramos que esta es una falacia que no debe tener cabida en este Consejo, pues según lo demuestra la evidencia, los más afectados por tales medidas son justamente los pueblos a los que aparentemente se intenta proteger. Adicionalmente, estas medidas se han convertido en una herramienta política para crear inestabilidad, confrontación social derivada de la escasez, presión y condena externa, migración no deseada, aspectos que en muchos casos tienen como fin derrocar a ciertos regímenes gubernamentales. Mi delegación considera que la atención debe enfocarse en los pueblos afectados, quienes deberían tener todo el derecho de exigir reparación a quienes imponen medidas coercitivas unilaterales por la afectación que éstas causan en sus derechos humanos. Tomando las palabras del alto comisionado para los derechos humanos sobre considerar la exclusión de este Consejo a quienes están involucrados en violaciones graves de los derechos humanos, aquellos que aplican medidas coercitivas unilaterales deberían ocupar los primeros lugares de tal exclusión. Muchas gracias. Thank you. I now give the floor to the distinguished permanent representative of Qatar. Said the Rais, the bed a sheet be acta than Nikash al Ham, Washkar al Mutahadithin, ala ifadetam al Kayima, Kama Ukid, ala Nahad and Nikash yet Tessam be a Mia Kabira, Fihad at Tokit, a lady that are of Fihad and Adida, and Baina Habiladi, Ila Tadabir and Kasriya and Feradia, to call of Kulakawa and Mabad al Kanun al Duali, while Ara Sahel Kanun al Duali, the Hukul and San. أننا في دولة قطر ندين ونستنكر هذا السلوك الغير أخلاقي وغير القانوني في العلاقات الدولية والذي من شأنه أن يخالف انتهاكات جسيمة لحقوق الإنسان تتجاوز النطاق الجغرافي للدول ويضع عقبات أمام تحقيق التنمية بجميع جوانبها الاقتصادية والاجتماعية ويؤثر على التعاون الدولي في هذا الصدد بالنظر إلى فداحة الانتهاكات المترتبة على التدابير القصرية الانفرادية يصبح من المهم تفعيل جميع آليات مجلس حقوق الإنسان للتصدي لها ومن بينها نؤكد على أهمية بناء توافق في الأراء من أجل وضع مبادئ ومواجهات أساسية للتعامل مع هذه التدابير القصرية فإننا نؤيد بصفة خاصة إنشاء آلية مستقلة لرصد وتقييم وتوثيق الأثار السلبية للتدابير القصرية على تتمتع الأشخاص بحقوق الإنسان والعمل على اقتراح إجراءات عملية لمعالجة مسائل الانتصاف والتعويض بغير تعزيز المسائل وجبر الضرر وختام المداخلة بالتوجه بالسؤال للسيد جان زيغلر حول تقييم التدابير التي فرضتها عدد من الدول مؤخرا على دولة قطر والتحقيق الانتصاف والتعويض كما أتوجه بالسؤال للسيد ليفرد ديزال حول رأيه بشأن التأثير السلبي للتدابير القسرية التي اتخذت ضد دولة قطر على احترام سيادة الوطنية والسلامة الإقليمية والاستقلال السياسي وحق تقرير المصير للأزم لإقامة نظام دولي ديمقراطي ومنصف شكرا سيد الرئيس Thank you uh, I will now turn to the list of speakers for national human rights institutions and non-governmental organizations we start with the national human rights institutions and we have the national human rights committee of Qatar سيد الرئيس انطلاقا من قرار الجمعية العامة رقم 60251 أن يتحمل المجلس المسؤولية عن تعزيز الاحترام العالمي لحماية حقوق جميع الإنسان جميع حقوق الإنسان والحريات الأساسية للجميع دون تمييز من أي نوع وبطريقة عادلة ومنصفة وتأكيدا على ما ورد في تقارير المقرر الخاص بأن التدابير القسرية الانفرادية تشمل على سبيل المثال لا الحصر التدابير الاقتصادية والسياسية التي تفرضها دول أو مجموعات دول لإكراه دولة أخرى على التبعية لها في ممارسة حقوقها السيادية بهدف حملها على إجراء تغيير محدد في سياساتها العامة وهي أيضا التدابير الشاملة التي تستهدف النظام الاقتصادي أو المالي لبلد برمته وكمثال ملموس على هذا الموضوع قامت اللجنة الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان بدولة قطر من خلال آليات الرصد واستقبال الشكاوي والتحقيق وتوافق مع اختصاصاتها وفق مبادئ باريس رصدت أن التدابير القسرية الأحادية التي تمارسها عدة دول ضد المواطنين القطريين أدت إلى انتهاكات للعديد من الحقوق من الحق في الإقامة والعمل والصحة والتنقل والملكية والتعليم وغيرها ولو أخذنا على سبيل المثال فقد رصدت اللجنة الوطنية لحقوق الإنسان انتهاكات واسعة للحق في الملكية خاصة الملكية الخاصة جراء الإجراءات الأحادية التعسفية ضد مواطني دولة قطر 
ادت الى منعهم من السفر او الوصول الى ممتلكاتهم وشركاتهم وحساباتهم واستثماراتهم او حتى التصرف بها في الدول التي اتخذت تلك الاجراءات التعسفيه ضدهم جميعا دون استثناء وبالتالي تعرضهم لخسائر فادحه وقد قطعت ارزاق العديد منهم او من يعمل لديهم وسلبت او هلكت او ضاعت اموالهم وممتلكاتهم مما دفع باكثر من الف من هؤلاء المتضررين بتقديم شكاوى للجنه الوطنيه وثقتها اللجنه وقد اعلنت اللجنه عن هذه الانتهاكات في تقاريرها وقد وجدنا صعوبه في البدء بالبحث عن الموارد والاليات اللازمه لتعزيز المساءله والتعويضات سواء عن طريق الامم المتحده وغيرها من المنظمات وصولا الى توكيل مكاتب محاماه خاصه شكرا Thank you. Next, uh, we go to the NGO list, and we have Sidwind. Thank you, Mr. President. Honorable panelists, we appreciate your contribution. Mr. Jazairi, we would like to use this opportunity to continue our interactive dialogue in the previous BNL panel. Two years ago, in reply to our intervention, you confirmed our concern on the impact of the sanction on people of Iran who were ill and had very limited or no access to the medicine. However, at the time, we did not receive any reply on the corruption and in all sectors of the society as a result of the sanction. People in Iran still remember how the Minister of Health in 2012 complained that uh, the Central Bank of Iran did not pay the currency which was allocated for the medicine to the Health Ministry and instead the budget was paid for import of the cosmetic. She was soon afterward dismissed by Ahmadinejad due to allegedly other reason. Two years ago, we referred to one case of unimaginable misuse of billion of US dollar of resources that was uh, the case of Babak Zanjani, who was sent to prison for corruption and is recently being sentenced to death, which we are opposed to. Since then, many other corruption cases have been brought to light. It might be true uh, that the President Ahmadinejad was part of the corruption web in the country during the sanction and might be put under pressure, but we firmly believe that the source of such uh, widespread corruption can be traced to Khamenei himself, who controls the revolutionary guard. Uh, Guards, the National Security Council and other decision-making institutions, we would like to express our concern on possibility of the reputation uh, of the situation. Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you. And next is UN Watch. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. President. In their writings, panelists Mr. Jazeri and Ms. Duhan have acknowledged that today's concept to describe sanctions as a violation of human rights is controversial. How can it be then that we just heard a panel of six members with complete conformity of opinion? Where, for example, is one person to represent the views of the European Union? As you know, they oppose the concept of this panel because, as they've explained, their sanctions on Sudan or Russia target the policies of human rights abusers, the means to conduct them, and those identified as responsible for these policies. The EU has stated on the record that this issue dwells essentially on relations between states instead of on concrete human rights of individuals and considers that this council is not the appropriate forum to address this issue. Why was there not one panelist to represent this position? Now, Mr. Ziegler mentioned that Cuba, Zimbabwe, Venezuela are victims of sanctions. Mr. Jazeri mentioned Sudan and Russia. All panelists point the finger, directly or indirectly, at sanctions by the U.S. and the EU and other democracies, which are designed to apply pressure to stop human rights abuses and which are typically supported by human rights defenders in those countries. By contrast, why has no panelist mentioned the unilateral coercive measures imposed for seven decades by the Arab Boycott Office? These began with the stated objective of destroying a UN member state and with no human rights purpose whatsoever. Why did not one panelist mention that according to the 2016 report of the US Commerce Department, those applying these coercive measures include the governments of Algeria, Bahrain, Iraq, Jordan, Kuwait, Lebanon, Libya, Oman, Qatar, Saudi Arabia, Syria, and the United Arab Emirates? I asked the representative of the High Commissioner, Ms. Hicks, how is this panel assembled? Why did the panel invite someone who co-founded the Qaddafi Human Rights Prize to help oppose sanctions against Libya? And why, when that gentleman spoke against the victims of Venezuela, are you not taking the floor to defend the report of your office, which spoke out against the terrible abuses being committed by the Maduro regime? Who will defend the High Commissioner's report and the victims of Venezuela? 
Thank you, Mr. President. Thank you, and it seems you have many questions that probably will need to be answered either through this uh, panel or after the panel. And uh, I think uh, we'll now we'll uh, have exhausted now the first segment of the list of speakers, both from the states and uh, NGOs and HRIs. And I will now give the floor back to the moderator and panelists to answer the questions and comments from the floor. Excellency Ambassador Valero, you have 15 minutes, please, in total for this segment before we continue with the list of speakers. Muchas gracias, distinguido vicepresidente. Habiendo escuchado comentarios eh, y sugerencias por parte tanto de los estados como de, la, de las organizaciones no gubernamentales, quisiéramos pasar inmediatamente a darle el derecho de palabra a los distinguidos panelistas para que procedan a hacer sus eh, comentarios o respuestas a interrogantes que hayan surgido durante la tarde. Comencemos entonces con el señor Idris Yaisari, relator especial sobre el impacto negativo de las medidas coercitivas unilaterales en el disfruto de los derechos humanos. Tiene usted la palabra, distinguido relator. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. <coughs> It's true that, uh... UN diplomacy sometimes uh, uh, gets the assembly or the council to adopt resolutions which are a bit ambiguous. If you look at the series of resolutions which have been referred, which have referred to UCMs, you see uh, basically two categories of resolutions. The ones that were quoted uh, on the uh, Vienna Declaration and also the SDGs which prohibit the imposition of uh, uh, unilateral coercive resolutions that are contrary to international law, etc. And you have a series of uh, other resolutions, which, uh, the last of which was the resolution adopted by this council last year, resolution 3413, saying in a clear manner resolution uh, uh, UCMs are contrary to international law. So it really is a case where in the Vienna Declaration and the SDGs everybody wanted to, to agree on a unanimous text, so they, they interpreted this sentence differently. The developing countries to which I spoke said that for them this sentence meant that all unilateral coercive measures were against international law, and the developed countries said that, uh, no, there are some that are uh, supportive of international law and some that are not. When I was on my recent visit to the European Union, and I, my report will, alas, be, have to be processed uh, and discussed later, uh, I, I asked the European Union officials that your guidelines say the same thing, that the European Union will not apply uh, uh, unilateral, uh, uh, they call it restrictive measures that are contrary to international law. Then I said, well, we need to know which ones are contrary to international law and which ones are not and I haven't gotten an answer yet. So perhaps uh, in our future contacts, informal contacts between the different groups, we might uh, try to get, uh, have a, a kind of a dialogue because as one NGO said, it's a pity that we haven't heard uh, the voice of any EU or other uh, targeting countries in this debate this afternoon and this morning, we only heard one voice and I would really encourage all parties to express their different views and, and from that we can gradually come to a common understanding. The position is also interesting on the question of extraterritoriality because there the EU itself considers that extraterritoriality is against international law. It adopted in 1996 blocking statutes in this respect and therefore, there is a possibility to engage in trying to define with the other countries 
a, 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 convergent, a convergence in this field. I just wanted to put emphasis on that as time is limited, but I remain available to any of you if you like to discuss this, the issue with me outside this meeting. Thank you. Muchas gracias, distinguido relator. Y ahora vamos a darle la palabra a la señora Alena Duan de la Universidad Internacional Mixto, Minsk, Bielorrusia. Thank you very much. Unfortunately, when we discussed the problems of unilateral coercive measures, we talked too much about the policy. And sometimes we got an impression that the policy in this sphere and the law in this sphere are two things which never face each other. Therefore, it's necessary finally to do what the whole international system was planned to do. We need to guarantee that the rule of law is observed at the international level and it will help to, help to solve a lot of problems. For example, for the last 10 years we discussed a lot the problems how to establish the new mechanism, forgetting that already a lot of mechanisms exist. Therefore, I will repeat once again, and here I will support Mr. Jazuri, that we need to know what is legal and what is illegal. And as soon as we decide what the unilateral coercive measures is, quite a lot of dispute will go away. But the problem is that not everyone is ready for the discussion. The international law knows how to define legal or illegal activity. For example, if the means of pressures breach economic, humanitarian or any other obligation of states, they breach international law. If we speak about targeted sanctions in the current form, they are definitely illegal. As far as on the first hand, they break procedural guarantees, which are the use cogence norms. The international law also provides mechanisms for peaceful settlement of international disputes. And as we know, already in 1907, the Hague Convention outlawed the use of force as the means of settlement of international disputes. Later documents not only prohibited the use of force in general, but they also outlawed the use of pressure for political purposes beside the cases when these means of pressure are definitely legal, the illegality is excluded under general international law, or it, these means of pressure are authorized by the UN Security Council. We shouldn't forget that the illegal means do not only infringe human rights, but also they in, uh, infringe the democratic legal order. They undermine the rule of law and endanger international peace and security. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, distinguida. Doctora Duan, ahora vamos a darle la palabra al señor Jan Siller, quien es miembro del Comité Asesor del Consejo de Derechos Humanos. Monsieur le Vice-Président, Excellence, Mesdames, Messieurs, je vais répondre à deux questions. Une de, très précise de Monsieur l'Ambassadeur du Qatar et l'autre tout à, euh, à l'heure pour l'ONG qui vient d'intervenir. Euh, en ce qui concerne euh, le Qatar, le Qatar est sous sanction unilatérale de la part de l'Arabie Saoudite et des Émirats Arabes Unis. La seule frontière terrestre qu'a le Qatar avec la péninsule arabique, c'est celle avec euh, l'Arabie Saoudite. Cette frontière est hermétiquement fermée. Euh, le blocus s'étend aux liaisons aériennes également qui sont interrompues entre le Qatar et l'Arabie Saoudite et les Émirats unis et euh, les conséquences évidemment pour, le, pour, les, pour la population du Qatar sont totalement dramatiques puisque comme vous le savez le Qatar c'est le premier producteur de gaz naturel du monde mais a pratiquement pas de terre agricole. Autrement dit pour nourrir la population, pour ne prendre que cet exemple, on pourrait prendre les médicaments etc. Il faut du commerce, et il faut des importations possibles soit par avion euh, soit par euh, navire et surtout par terre. Et tout ça est mis en question par ce blocus. Donc le blocus a des conséquences immédiates, c'est évident, sur la jouissance ou plutôt la non-jouissance des droits économiques, sociaux et culturels de la population et donc un, un blocus euh, sanction unilatérale totalement, absolument illégal. 
Euh, il est vrai, on peut répondre, que la Russie, l'Iran et la Turquie essayent par mer de suppléer de la nourriture et des médicaments, euh, par exemple, mais c'est évidemment, ça n'enlève rien au fait, je le répète, que ce blocus-là est totalement, absolument illégal et doit se terminer. Monsieur l'ambassadeur m'a demandé, mais qu'est-ce qu'il faut faire euh, Tout à l'heure, monsieur Desayas a euh, mentionné le rapport de Marc Poswit, vous savez, le premier grand rapport, le grand ou pas grand, le premier rapport important sur la question qui nous préoccupe a été fait par la sous-commission qui n'existe plus, qui est l'organisation qui a précédé notre comité, par Marc Poswit, euh, sur les sanctions unilatérales euh, de l'an 2000, 2000. Et une des conclusions les plus fortes de Poswit était de dire « mais c'est la Cour » International, Cour de justice de l'AE, qui doit se pencher sur le problème des compensations. Autrement dit, euh, personne n'a contredit ces conclusions au Conseil des droits de l'homme. À l'époque, la Cour de justice euh, de l'AE est compétente, selon la conviction de la majeure partie de, des États membres du, de la Commission à l'époque et du Conseil aujourd'hui, pour juger du bien fondé des compensations à obtenir pour la population du Qatar de la part des auteurs du, euh, euh, du blocus. Euh, L'ONG tout à l'heure a dit une chose intéressante, personne ne défend le blocus, euh, les, les mesures internationales, euh, sanctions internationales, personne au panel euh, défend. Nous avons beaucoup discuté au comité de cette, de cette question. Et il faut être très précis. Les sanctions internationales, en soi, en soi, ne sont pas illégales. La Suisse exporte, je prends mon pays, la Suisse exporte 60% de sa production en Allemagne fédérale. Si le gouvernement suisse, pour une raison ou une autre, dit on ne fait plus de commerce avec l'Allemagne, ce n'est pas une illégalité. On peut le faire. On ne peut pas forcer un État souverain de faire du commerce avec tel ou tel autre partenaire. Ça, c'est évident. Mais ce dont nous parlons aujourd'hui, par exemple, je prends de nouveau l'ordre de M. Trump du 24 19, août 1917. Cet exécutif ordre, je n'ai pas le temps, je vous l'ai résumé tout à l'heure, je n'ai pas le temps de le lire, mais il est très détaillé, très clair. C'est une déclaration de guerre économique à la Venezuela, au Venezuela déclaration de guerre économique au Venezuela. La loi Helms-Burton, qui est au fondement de, du blocus de plus de 50 ans contre le peuple cubain, eh bien, c'est une déclaration de guerre avec des conséquences sociales et humaines, euh, humaines dramatiques de la part euh, des États-Unis d'Amérique. Ce n'est pas simplement le refus de commercer. C'est un ensemble de mesures et je reviens à l'exécutif ordre du président Trump, c'est un ensemble de mesures qui veut mettre à genoux, politiquement, économiquement, financièrement et socialement, un gouvernement qui ne plaît pas à Washington pour une raison ou une autre. Ce qui est l'affaire de l'appréciation américaine et pas de ce Conseil. C'est une déclaration de guerre et donc toutes les interventions très intéressantes qui ont été faites ici tout à l'heure après notre discussion de la tribune, disent dès qu'il a violation des droits économiques, sociaux et culturels et du droit collectif au développement de la population agressée, là, il y a illégalité. Là, il y a illégalité. Et là, il faut, comme l'a dit déjà la résolution de 2012, qui était la première résolution du Conseil sur, la, sur ces problématiques, la résolution 1932 de 2012, là, il faut interdire purement et simplement toute sanction unilatérale. Voilà, j'espère avoir répondu aux questions. Muchas gracias, Dr. Hiller. Ahora vamos a darle la palabra al Dr. Alfred de Sayas, experto independiente sur la promotion d'un ordre international démocratique et équitatif. Muchísimas gracias, Embajador Valero. Uh, first, I wish to address 
a uh, comment of the Chinese uh, delegation. From the perspective of my mandate, our international order is based on the UN Charter, uh, on uh, multilateralism, and respect for the sovereign equality of states. And uh, I refer you to Resolution 18, Bar 6 of the Human Rights Council, which created the mandate of the independent expert on um, a democratic and equitable international order, which incorporates a whole series of uh, legal instruments, which are the basis and which inform uh, the application of my mandate. The international order is sabotaged when states unilaterally impose sanctions or blockades on other states without Security Council approval. Uh, this entails grave violations of fundamental principles of international law, including the freedom of commerce, freedom of navigation, and the principle of non-interference on the internal affairs of states. How to correct the negative impacts? Uh, first, by the immediate termination of sanctions, and second, by providing recourse and effective remedy uh, to the victims and uh, populations negatively affected, not only in the states targeted, but also in third states which endure the consequences of these uh, sanctions uh, as uh, collateral damage. Uh, the delegation of Qatar uh, asked the question about the adverse effects of uh, sanctions on the sovereignty of Qatar. Yes, indeed, uh, the sanctions do impact very negatively uh, on the sovereignty, and not only on the sovereignty of Qatar. They are totally incompatible with uh, General Assembly Resolution 2625 and with fundamental principles of the UN Charter. Uh, I propose uh, the use uh, or invoking the interstate uh, complaints procedure of the uh, Human Rights uh, Committee, uh, a procedure that has promised but is yet uh, to be utilized. Uh, I also propose that the General Assembly should request the International Court of Justice an advisory opinion on the legal consequences of unilateral coercive measures and uh, the uh, obligation of those states that impose sanctions to provide reparation to the victims. Finally, I endorse the clarifications provided by my colleagues uh, Idris Yazairi uh, Alain uh, Duhan and Jean Ziegler. Thank you. Muchas gracias, eh, Dr. Alfred Sayas. Y ahora eh, me permito de nuevo trasladar la palabra al distinguido embajador Arm Ramadan, vicepresidente de este foro, quien eh, continuará eh, liderando las sesiones. Thank you, moderator, and uh, we'll now proceed uh, with the second segment of our list of speakers, and I give the floor to the distinguished representative of Sudan. Sudan, are you in the room? Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. Sayyid Rais. يضم السودان بيانه إلى البيانات المقدمة من المجموعة الأفريقية والمجموعة العربية والمجموعة الإسلامية ومجموعة عدم الانحياز ومجموعة الدول المتوافقة الآراء لقد تأخر المجتمع الدولي كثيرا حتى توصل إلى إنشاء إلى إنشاء ولاية لمقرر خاص يعني بدراسة الأثر السالب للعقوبات القصرية على التمتع بحقوق الإنسان وفي هذا السياق نجدد ترحيبنا وتأكيدنا على أهمية التجديد لولاية المقرر الخاص في هذه الولاية سيد الرئيس إن الادعاء بأن هذه العقوبات مجرد تدابير أو إنها عقوبات 
ذكية تؤدي إلى وفاء الدول بالالتزامات الدولية هو كلام مقاير ومجاف للحقيقة فهذه العقوبات تخالف ميثاق الأمم المتحدة والقانون الدولي ولعدم صدورها من مجلس الأمن تعتبر انتهاكا صريحا لمواثيق الدولية وقد أثبتت التجارب العملية أن العقوبات تتضرر منها الشعوب والأسر في تفاصيل حياتهم اليومية من حيث لم الشمل والتأثير على كافة معيشتهم سوى في الصحة أو التعليم أو غيرها من الخدمات الأساسية هذا الأمر يجعلنا نؤكد تفعيل آليات التسجيل لحصر الضرر الناجم من هذا الحصار غير المشروع وتفعيل الآليات الدولية لضمان المساءلة والتعويض وفوق ذلك أهمية أن يتولى المجتمع الدولي بناء الأنظمة الكفيلة بعدم تكرار هذه العقوبات أو أن تكون سنة متكررة تمارس الدول تمارس آه على الدول ختاما سيد الرئيس يؤكد السودان توصيات التوصيات الواردة في تقرير المقرر الخاص فيما يخص السجل المركزي وتطبيق قواعد السلوك في الفترة الانتقالية ويرى أنها قد رسمت طريق خروج عالج الأزمات الناتجة من هذه العقوبات ويكافح آثارها السالبة على المجتمعات بآليات دولية مقبولة وفي هذا الإطار تطلب بلادي من المجلس الموقر التأكيد على تسجيل الأضرار الناجمة من هذا الحصار مع الضمانات الكفيلة بالتعويض كافة الأضرار وصولا للانتصاف وجبر الضرر وشكرا سيد الرئيس Thank you and I now give the floor to the delegation of Venezuela Gracias señor presidente Venezuela se asocia a la intervención de Egipto a nombre del grupo de países ideas afines y agradece la presentaciones realizadas por los distinguidos ponentes. Nos complace la celebración de este importante panel bienal sobre el impacto negativo de las medidas coercitivas unilaterales en el goce de todos los derechos humanos. Señor Presidente, la imposición de estas medidas coercitivas unilaterales por parte de algunos estados son utilizadas como medida de presión política o económica contra los países en desarrollo. Son violatorias del derecho internacional y constituyen un serio obstáculo para el disfrute de los derechos humanos, incluido el derecho al desarrollo. Este Consejo ha condenado el efecto negativo de esas medidas que impiden y condicionan el derecho a la autodeterminación de los pueblos, instando a proscribirlas. Recientemente el gobierno de los Estados Unidos ha intentado coaccionar al pueblo de Venezuela y al legítimo gobierno del presidente Nicolás Maduro con imposición de medidas coercitivas unilaterales, confiscando activos del patrimonio venezolano en su territorio, afectando con esto la principal fuente de divisas del país. Esta actitud pone en peligro la paz y la seguridad nacional y regional. Rechazamos de la manera más categórica la promulgación de leyes ilegales con efectos extraterritoriales que entrañan una intromisión en los asuntos externos de los estados y vulneran su soberanía. Venezuela reitera su llamado a rechazar las medidas unilaterales de co coerción contra cualquier estado y a reconocer sus nefastas consecuencias sobre los derechos humanos, las relaciones comerciales internacionales, la paz, la seguridad y el bienestar de la humanidad. Muchas gracias, señor presidente. Thanks to you. And uh, next is Zimbabwe. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. My delegation wishes to thank the distinguished panelists for their insightful presentations, particularly in relation to the identification of post sable mechanisms to assess and mitigate the adverse effects of UCMs. In its previous resolutions on the issue of UCMs, the Human Rights Council highlighted the fact that these measures are in breach of international law and that they have a negative impact on human rights, development, trade, investment, and international cooperation. To this end, the Council and the General Assembly have both called upon states to stop adopting, maintaining, or, or implementing UCMs. Further, a number of human rights treaty bodies have raised the need for special measures to alleviate the negative effect of such measures. <coughs> As a victim, Zimbabwe can testify to the far-reaching consequences of economic sanctions on the enjoyment of human rights, particularly among the most vulnerable groups. In this regard, we welcome the proposals aimed at developing remedial measures that have emerged from this discussion. 
It is our hope that this council will give due consideration to these and similar proposals that came out of the interactive dialogue held earlier with the special rapporteur on the negative impact of UCMs. In conclusion, my delegation wishes to add its voice to calls for those states applying UCMs to terminate them and for all states to undertake to renounce the use of UCMs. I thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thanks to you, Zimbabwe. And I now give the floor to Pakistan. Thank you, Mr. President. Pakistan believes uh, that exercise of power, political or economic, which affects people's lives must be subject to democratic controls and compatible with the purposes and principles of the Charter of the UN. This is essential uh, for establishing democratic and equitable international order. Unilateral coercive measures in the form of sanctions adversely impact the most vulnerable. Once, uh, such one-sided measures can be counterproductive as the women and children become the ultimate sufferers. There is a need to examine the impacts of unilateral uh, coercive measures on the international humanitarian and human rights law, and especially on the economy, peace and security and the social fabric of states, giving due consideration to the most vulnerable. We remain very concerned about the negative effects on the most vulnerable, the women and the children, and who are often the unintended but eventual uh, targets. Mr. President, we believe that there is need for an independent mechanism of the UN human rights machinery for the victims of unilateral coercive measures to address the issues of remedies and, with, and redress with a view to promoting accountability and reparations. Thank you. I thank the permanent representative of Pakistan and I now give the floor to Fiji. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Fiji thanks the panelists on unilateral coercive measures and human rights for their presentations and, the, and their work. UCMs in the form of economic sanctions have far-reaching implications for human rights of the general population of targeted states. These measures hinder the ability of targeted states to promote, protect and preserve various human rights such as the right to life, the right to health, the right to food, rights to education and the right to development. UCMs have a direct impact often on the most vulnerable citizens. Unilateral economic sanctions have a disproportionate impact on those who are already afflicted by poverty and discrimination and whose existing vulnerabilities are exacerbated by the effect of such sanctions. Therefore, Fiji supports the promotion of peaceful and cordial relations among member states within the Council as well as the UN framework and stresses the need for states to refrain from adopting, maintaining, implementing unilateral coercive measures on human rights. In this regard, Fiji supports the need to develop basic principles, guidelines and mechanisms to assess and mitigate the adverse impact of unilateral coercive measures on human rights. I thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thank you. Next is Algeria. Merci, Mr. Vice President. Ma délégation se félicite de l'organisation de cette réunion de débat biannuel, s'associe aux déclarations prononcées au nom de ces groupes d'appartenance et remercie l'ensemble des panélistes pour la qualité de leurs interventions. Même si les couches vulnérables de la population ne constituent pas forcément la cible initiale des sanctions imposées aux États, il n'en demeure pas moins que l'expérience a montré que ces populations subissent les effets néfastes. Plus généralement, et comme cela a été rapporté par les distingués panélistes, en plus de l'atteinte d'aspects la, spécifiques des droits de l'homme, que ce soit les droits civils et politiques ou économiques, sociaux et culturels, l'application de ces mesures a un impact inévitable sur la souveraineté nationale des États, avec toutes les conséquences que cela engendre à l'intérieur des pays qui subissent ces mesures, comme entraver le développement, faisant ainsi accroître la pauvreté chronique des populations. L'absence des moyens ou voies de recours pour les victimes alourdit les répercussions négatives sur les populations touchées et freine les initiatives qui tendent à faire que ces mesures ne puissent exister en dehors du cadre des organes compétents et mécanismes des Nations Unies. La communauté internationale est invitée à se pencher sur une approche concrète pour mettre en place ou rendre effectifs des mécanismes efficaces pour endiguer l'évolution inquiétante des mesures coercitives et retourner à la balance de sorte qu'au lieu de faire supporter aux, popul aux populations les conséquences négatives de ces mesures, il devienne juridiquement impératif de passer par la légalité internationale avant de les adopter. Aussi, Ma délégation souhaiterait savoir si le problème qui nous réunit ici est dû à une absence 
insuffisance ou ineffectivité de mécanismes au niveau du droit international qui prennent en charge la question des mesures coercitives unilatérales. Je vous remercie, Monsieur le Vice-président. I thank you and I now give the floor to Iraq. شكرا سيد نائب الرئيس. صوت العراق لصالح القرار 13 الصادر عن دورة 34 لمجلس حقوق الإنسان والمعنون حقوق الإنسان والتدابير القسرية الانفرادية وذلك لما عاناه خلال عقد التسعينات من تدابير ومقاطعة اقتصادية أضرت بشرائح المجتمع العراقي ولا سيما النساء والأطفال وكبار السن وذوي الاحتياجات الخاصة والذين عانوا من نقص في الغذاء والدواء والصحة والتعليم ومواكبة الركب العالمي في التنمية ويؤكد العراق من منطلق تجربته السابقة أن التدابير القسرية أو حادية الجانب تضرب بالشرائح الأضعف والأفقر في المجتمعات دون أن تمس بقياداتها السياسية سيدي ناب الرئيس إن العراق ومن منطلق تعزيز الحقوق الاقتصادية والاجتماعية والثقافية يرى أن فرض العقوبات الاقتصادية وحادية الجانب تستهدف الفئات المستضعفة في المجتمع وتؤدي إلى زيادة البطالة والفقر المدقع وتضر بالنظام الصحي والتعليمي مما يعيق تحقيق أهداف أجندة التنمية المستدامة 2030 وشكرا I thank you and I now give the floor to the distinguished permanent representative of United Arab Emirates. شكرا سيد نائب الرئيس. ألقي هذا البيان باسم دولة الإمارات العربية المتحدة والمملكة العربية السعودية ومملكة البحرين وجمهورية مصر العربية. ونرحب بعقد حلقة النقاش ونعيد للتأكيد على إدانتنا لفرض إجراءات قسرية لما تمثله من تناقض مع القوانين الدولية وانتهاكها لحقوق الإنسان في هذا الإطار وردا على ما ذكره مندوب قطر وما أشار إليه جون زيجلر عضو اللجنة الاستشارية فإننا نعيد التأكيد على أن الإجراءات التي اتخذتها الدول الأربع هي قرارات سيادية مشروعة لا تعد بحال من الأحوال حصار بلوكيت وإنما مقاطعة بويكوت مقاطعة لبعض أوجه التعاون الثنائي نابعة من الضرر الذي تسببت فيه التصرفات القطرية غير المسؤولة من دعمها وتمويلها وإيوائها للإرهاب والعناصر الإرهابية وهو ما دفع دولنا لاتخاذ قرارها بالمقاطعة إذا كان الشعب القطري قد تضرر مما أسماه ممثل قطر بحصار دول المقاطعة كيف يمكن له أن يفسر تصريحات كبار المسؤولين في بلده التي تؤكد بعدم تأثرها ومواطنيها جراء قطع العلاقات الدبلوماسية معها وبأن الحياة تجري وبشكل طبيعي جدا في رأينا تكشف هذه التناقضات التي تنتجها وباستمرار السياسة القطرية عن ازدواجية الخطاب حيث أن هناك خطابا موجها للاستهلاك الداخلي وخطابا ثانيا لمغالطة الرأي العام الدولي وتعويم الأسباب الحقيقية للأزمة والمتمثلة كما يعلم الجميع في دعم قطر للإرهاب وتبويل المنظمات الإرهابية إنه من المؤسف أن يعيد الوفد القطري طرح هذا الأمر للمرة الثانية خلال هذا اليوم وهو أن دل على شيء فإنما يدل على عدم وجود نية صادقة من قطر لمراجعة سياساتها ومواقفها الداعمة للإرهاب وتطرف وشكرا السيد نائب الرئيس Thank you, and I now give the floor to the delegation of Nicaragua. Gracias, señor vicepresidente. Nicaragua da la bienvenida a los distinguidos panelistas y agradece sus aclaradoras presentaciones. Adherimos las intervenciones del MNOAL y del MEG. En nuestra capacidad nacional deseamos aportar lo siguiente. Como expresado esta mañana, Nicaragua condena firmemente la aplicación de MSU por contravenir estas el derecho internacional, el derecho internacional humanitario, el derecho internacional de los derechos humanos y los propósitos y principios de la Carta de Naciones Unidas. No podemos obviar que en la tradición de la diplomacia de cañonero, las MSU son hoy utilizadas como instrumentos de agresión no militar para presionar, influenciar y limitar el libre ejercicio de la autodeterminación de los estados a las que son aplicadas 
con el fin de avanzar intereses económicos y geopolíticos particulares. Asimismo, son condenables especialmente por el impacto negativo que éstas tienen en los derechos humanos fundamentales de los pueblos y las personas, incluido el derecho al desarrollo. Por tanto, así como la guerra y los armamentos están reglamentados en el derecho internacional humanitario y los instrumentos internacionales relevantes, en función de minimizar el impacto en la vida de los civiles y los no combatientes, se hace evidente que la aplicación de las MSU también debe ser regulada y gradualmente desfasada. En este sentido, el alcance y efecto extraterritorial de las MCU debe ir acompañado del reconocimiento de la extraterritorialidad de las obligaciones internacionales en materia de derechos humanos de quienes las aplican. La proclamación de una declaración sobre las medidas coercitivas unilaterales y los derechos humanos podría ser uno de los pasos en esa dirección. Asimismo, las víctimas del impacto negativo de estas medidas deben tener acceso a vías de recurso para reclamar reparaciones por los perjuicios causados al pleno goce de sus derechos humanos. El establecimiento de un registro central de las sanciones unilaterales que puedan afectar los derechos humanos y de una comisión de inmunización especial como mecanismo de rendición de cuentas podría facilitar esta necesidad de justicia. Para finalizar, señor Vicepresidente, con su venia, siendo la última vez que, nos, que podamos dirigirnos en el seno de este Consejo al doctor Tesayas en su calidad de experto independiente sobre el orden internacional democrático equitativo, deseamos reconocerle y reiterarle la gratitud de esta delegación por el invaluable servicio que ha prestado en tal función a este Consejo y al Sistema Onusiano de Derechos Humanos. Gracias, señor Vicepresidente. IDO and Americans for Democracy and Human Rights in Bahrain would like to thank the distinguished panel for their remarks. We echo the conclusions of the report and we share its concerns on the negative impact of unilateral coercive measures on human rights, development, international relations, trade, investment and cooperation. In this context, we feel these impacts are illustrated most clearly by the unilateral coercive measures imposed on Yemen by the Saudi-led coalition through a total air and sea blockade and uninterrupted airstrikes on civilians and civilian infrastructure, likely amounting to war crimes. These measures are currently causing the Yemeni population to be deprived of essential goods, such as food and medicines, and stop them from freely pursuing their own economic, social, and cultural development. These measures have further detrimental effects beyond the immediate economic and humanitarian impact. This blockade at its outset interrupted an ongoing political dialogue to the detriment of Yemeni's self-determination. The blockade's impact on food and medical transfers has drastic effects on the right to health and the right to life. Finally, the threat to regional stability and greater human displacement has only externalized and exacerbated all of these human rights and humanitarian abuses. With this in mind, we ask, while this Council has previously adopted proposals and is currently renewing considerations for accountability mechanisms for a range of Yemen-based human rights abuses, what accountability mechanisms exist, or would you suggest, for addressing such inherently external and multilateral human rights abuses, such as universal, uh, sorry, unilateral coercive measures? Thank you. Thanks to you. Uh, next is Maarik Foundation for Peace and Development. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Maarik Foundation for Peace and Development and Eastern Sudan for Women Development Organization would like first to support all the practical recommendations and proposals of the special reporter, including his current report to the HRC, through which we can see solutions to the current crisis and initiatives for the future preventive measures. Mr. Vice President, the inter interpretation of Article 2.1 of the ICESCR, as it gives a mandate of extraterritorial sanctions, is in contradiction with Article 25 of the same covenant, which reads nothing in the present covenant shall be interpreted as impairing the, in the in inherent right of all peoples to enjoy, util utilize fully freely their natural wealth and resources. Given that the negative impacts of the UCMs on the enjoyment of people with their natural wealth and resources is now well known to the HRC. 
We call upon the Council to go further steps and start developing an international treaty to prevent UCMs with a permanent committee to monitor in its implementation having mandate of receiving complaints from states, entities and individuals and be authorized to reparation and com compensation. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Thanks to you. And the next is the International Council. شكرا سيد الرئيس اننا اذ نشارك مجلسكم الموقر قلقه الشديد ازاء مع التدابير القسرية الانفرادية من اثر سلبي على حقوق الانسان والتنمية حيث لا يجوز لاي دولة ان تستخدم اي نوع من التدابير او ان تشجع على استخدامها لاكراه دولة اخرى على التبعية لها في ممارسة حقوقها السيادية سيد الرئيس ما تقوم به السعودية منذ سنوات من تعدي واكراه غير اخلاقي في فرض الوصاية على جوارها من دول الخليج وما قامت به مؤخرا ضد دولة قطر وحصار شعبها وقبلها حصار اليمن والحروب الظالمة التي تشنها هنا وهناك للافتئات على سيادة الدول لتتبعها في ذلك حكومة ابو ظبي وغيرها من الدول التي تشارك السعودية في اتخاذ تدابير قسرية حادية على شكل عقوبات اقتصادية خلفت تبعات كارثية في اليمن وقطر مست صميم حقوق الانسان المكفولة في الدول المستهدفة واحدثت تغيير احدثت اثرا بالغا وقع على الفقراء والطبقات الاكثر ضعفا هذا الاستبداد السعودي المتواصل هو امتداد لما فعلته في العراق وسوريا والعالم ونجمت عن تكاليف باهظة على صعيد حقوق الانسان الذي من المفترض ان لا يجوز في اي ظرف من الظروف حرمان الناس من السبل الاساسية لبقائهم واننا اذ نثني على مطالبة الحكومة القطرية اليوم من المجتمع الدولي افهام السعودية وفقا لالياتها الاشد بان جميع حقوق الانسان عالمية وغير قابلة للتجزئة وغير قابلة للتصرف وبشكل اساسي وجزء لا يتجزأ من جميع حقوق الانسان السيد الرئيس ما زلنا نتطلع ان يولي مجلسكم الاهمية اللازمة للتصدي للتدابير القسرية غير المشروعة التي تتخذها حكومة المغرب ضد الشعب الصحراوي في اقليم الصحراء الغربية المطالب بحقه في تقرير مصيره كما نطالب بسرعة تحرك الاممي للتصدي لجرائم الابادة التي ترتكب في مانيمار واخيرا فان ما تتعرض له فنزويلا اليوم اشبه بما تعرضت له سوريا فحذار من التعاطي مع هذا الملف باتخاذ تدابير احادية للجانب وقسرية رأفة ورحمة بالشعب الفنزويلي العظيم شكرا سيد الرئيس Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, this was the last speaker that we could accommodate at this session. I will now give the floor back to the moderator and the panelists for their concluding remarks. You have the floor, Ambassador Valero. Muchas gracias, Excelencia, Vicepresidente Am Ramadan. Quisiera pasar inmediatamente a darle el derecho de palabra a los distinguidos panelistas, empezando por el doctor Idris Yazairi. Tiene usted la palabra, distinguido relator. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I just leave two remarks with this uh, August gathering. First, uh, the international human rights law should be able to protect people in peacetime at least as much as the humanitarian law protects people in wartime. But amazingly, this is not the case. So I think we should uh, keep this in mind, how to improve the implementation of international human rights law to make it provide a decent outcome to the impact of uh, unilateral coercive measures. Secondly, I want to remind everybody that only recently in the adoption of the Sustainable Development Goals Declaration for 2030, all countries committed themselves, renewed their commitment to respecting the rule of law both nationally and internationally. Now, surely, after we've heard this discussion this morning and this afternoon, there's something rotten in the state of Denmark. Excuse me, Denmark. Uh, th therefore, uh, th there is a problem. There's a problem of the rule of law. And I would suggest that in good faith, we try to, ex uh, to tackle it 
very much in the spirit of the commitment that we took in the SDGs. Uh, th there was one question that was put that I'd like to comment on. It was made by Algeria. Do you mean, dependent members, uh, that the present mechanisms uh, for redress and compensation are not effective? Well, I think this was the whole point of my statement from the beginning to the end. Uh, we need to put our heads together to uh, adopt a, a declaration which establishes some rules of behavior in this field of UCM, and I suggest we all engage in that in, in common, in the spirit of consensus, because as I said earlier, the best thing is to prevent the situation where UCMs can occur. If we prevent the situation, it will be much simpler than addressing it once it's there and it stays for 20 or 50 years. I thank you, Mr. Chair, Mr. Moderator. Gracias, distinguido relator. Ahora vamos a darle la palabra a la señora Alena Duan. Thank you very much. I would like to reflect a couple of remarks done by the honored speakers. Naturally, we can't speak that all means of pressure applied by one state or another are ipsa facto illegal. Naturally, there are lots of exceptions when, when case, states try to influence their neighbors or any other states by different means. Some of these means have already been mentioned today. Sending diplomatic notes, severing diplomatic relations, concluding agreements or deciding not to conclude agreements or not to prolong agreements if we don't want to cooperate with this state any longer. It can legally be done. If, for example, some drastic situations are happening, like mass gross violation of human rights or harboring terrorists on its territory which are committing terrorist acts actively, there is an institute of countermeasures. And one state can put some pressure on the other, but within the legal limits of countermeasures. It means that no principles of international law shall be broken, including the prohibition to use force, prohibition of intervention, or the need to settle disputes in a peaceful way. Measures applied shall be proportionate, and no human rights shall be violated as well as no humanitarian reparation shall take place. Therefore, before applying the unilateral coercive measures, it is necessary to assess whether the measures which are planned to be applied fall within this territory. If they are not, they are unilateral coercive measures, they are illegal, they shall not be applied, or if they already do, they shall be withdrawn. And as concerned the Algerian remark, I will support here our honored special reporter. We do have mechanisms, but they do not function as they shall do, because there is no real dialogue. Here in this meeting, we mostly feed the countries which are complaining about being tajered. We do not see those who are tajering, and we do not see this dialogue. Until we have a dialogue, we won't have an effective mechanism. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Dr. Aduan. Ahora vamos a darle la palabra al distinguido Jan Ziegler. Oui, Monsieur le Vice-président, Excellence, Mesdames, Messieurs, eh, j'ai la première résolution qui a demandé l'interdiction des sanctions, des sanctions unilatérales euh, de, de ce Conseil date de euh, 2012. Donc il y a longtemps, de 2012, il y a 15 ans. C'est la première qui clairement demande l'interdiction de la de sanctions euh, unilatérales s'il est prouvé qu'il provoque des violations pour la population agressée de ses droits économiques, sociaux et culturels et de son droit au développement. C'est la résolution 
1932, je le répète, 2012. Alors, vous me disiez tout à l'heure, notre collègue l'a dit, rien ne bouge. C'est vrai, cette résolution est d'une clarté absolue, mais rien n'a bougé. Je prends l'exemple de Gaza, le peuple marty de Palestine subit depuis 2006 le blocus total, presque total, de la part de la puissance israélienne. Cuba, qui résiste héroïquement depuis 57 ans, blocus américain. J'espère que le Venezuela ne subira pas le même destin pour des dizaines d'années de blocus et de sanctions unilatérales américaines, mais <coughs> rien ne bouge. Alors, Kofi Annan a dit cette phrase que tout le monde connaît, « En matière de droits de l'homme, la conscience collective évolue, mais à la vitesse des glaciers. » À la vitesse des glaciers, c'est-à-dire très, très, très lentement. Ça ne nous dispense pas, tous, société civile, société académique, État, institutions des Nations Unies et notamment Conseil des droits de l'homme, de lutter pour que enfin ces normes internationales nouvelles soient créées, interdiction totale des euh, sanctions unilatérales provoquant, quand elles provoquent, des violations des droits de l'homme ou du droit collectif au développement. Cette obligation est la nôtre, et pour ma part, et pour la part de notre comité consultatif du Conseil des droits de l'homme, nous allons essayer de réaliser cette obligation et être fidèle à notre devoir. Voilà. Muchas gracias, Dr. Sigler, por su exposición. Y ahora vamos a darle la palabra al doctor, Jan, eh, al doctor eh, Alfred de Sayas. Gracias, embajador Valero. Yo acabo de regresar de la sala 23, donde hice una alocución en otro panel uh, que concierne uh, las uh, muertes en uh, 1988, 30.000 uh, prisioneros políticos en uh, Irán. Pero tengo entendido que Nicaragua tomó la palabra y mencionó mi informe, uh, pues muchísimas gracias por mencionar mi informe, que tiene desde luego uh, muchas uh, recomendaciones uh, concretas y pragmáticas. Uh, moving into English, because I think one of the points that I wanted to uh, bring out is the concept of uh, general principles of law. It's not just international law that is being violated by uh, the um, blockades, uh, by the embargoes, by the unilateral sanctions, but also a whole series of general principles uh, of law. Um, I refer to the statute of the International Court of Justice, Article 38, uh, little 1, little c. Now, these are principles of legality and legitimacy recognized by peoples and nations over the centuries and building blocks of treaties and other agreements. Such principles constitute the spirit of the law. I always like to give my students Montesquieu de l'esprit de loi and make reference uh, to what inspires the law, this spirit of the law. And among these general principles of law are good faith, ex injuria non auditor ius, estoppel, non-arbitrariness, all of which underpin the protection of state sovereignty, the prohibition of interference in the internal matters of states, the freedom of international trade, and the freedom of navigation, among others. Moreover, sanctions and embargoes violate the cardinal international judicial norm of pacta sunt servanda, since They hinder the compliance with valid treaties agreed upon according to international law. The extraterritorial application of national laws constitutes a new variant of colonialism, resulting in usurpation of sovereign competencies, bordering on annexation by means of overextension of jurisdictional exercise of power. I ask you to 
visualize what I'm saying. It is an usurpation of sovereign competencies bordering on an annexation by means of overextension of a judicial exercise of power. Now, I am quite I would almost say amused by the lack of good faith of many transnational corporations and many businesses and many investors. You know that I devoted my report 2015 to bilateral investment treaties and to free trade agreements and to the phenomenon of the parallel system of justice called investor state dispute settlement. These are these arbitrations uh, which are invariably biased in favor of uh, business and which encroach enormously on the sovereignty of states. Now, investment protection. Yes, the investors need protection, but also the states need protection from investors. But if we're looking at investing protection and some uh, businesses complain against Colombia because Colombia decides that it's not going to issue a permit to build a gold mine uh, in the Amazonian uh, rainforest or because uh, Canada is not issuing a permit for building uh, a carrière, a quarry uh, in a, an environmentally um, uh, sensitive area. These are the ontological functions of the state to regulate in the name of society, to protect the rights of the public. That's what a state is there for. Whereas throughout ISDS, uh, because they say, oh no, I'm going to make less money. I mean, this is going to impact on my profits. So I'll sue. And um, it is an anomaly that uh, businesses that have been impacted by unilateral course of measures, say if you have uh, businesses, uh, you are an exporter uh, of um, tomatoes to Russia, or you are an exporter of uh, chips or whatever, I mean digital chips and that sort of thing and suddenly you cannot export or you cannot import, you cannot sell your product uh, or buy products from that country, uh, you're going to suffer a major, a major financial loss. On the other hand, I don't see the ISDS uh, system being called upon to condemn the sanctions. And if you remember the text of the defunct or hopefully defunct uh, Trans-Pacific uh, uh, Partnership, the TPP, they woke up to this danger and they actually put in an exception in the text with regard to ISDS uh, saying that if uh, a person loses money because of unilateral coercion measures, uh, then he cannot sue. Whereas in the past, essentially in bilateral investment treaties or free trade agreements, in principle you could sue, but that has not happened. And as I said, uh, it, it uh, baffles the imagination, the lack uh, of good faith on the part of the business community that says, uh, I can sue a government because it doesn't let me build a quarry, but I cannot sue a government because it prohibits me uh, from selling my goods in, uh, in Qatar or selling my goods in Russia or selling my goods in Venezuela. Thank you. Gracias, uh, Dr. De Sayas. Como hemos podido escuchar durante el debate en esta tarde tan rico y tan interesante, sobre todo a partir de las intervenciones que han hecho los ponentes, que consideramos han dado una gran contribución para ir esclareciendo más aún este tema en la ruta hacia la aprobación de algún instrumento internacional que pudiera ponerle fin a estas medidas coercitivas unilaterales. Desafortunadamente en el debate que tuvimos y en el cual participaron los estados eh, vimos que hubo una absoluta 
eh, objeción a estas medidas coercitivas unilaterales, lamentablemente aquellos que a, aún las defienden o las aplican no elevaron su voz en esta tarde. Esperamos que en los próximos paneles que hagamos se pueda escuchar una eh, expresión mucho más diversa, pero obviamente que no es culpa de los organizadores de este foro, ni menos aún culpa de los panelistas de que no se hayan escuchado voces disidentes desde Estados. Sí hubo voces disidentes desde las ONG, que ya ustedes escucharon, pero también eh, le queda la impresión al moderador de que la comunidad mundial, incluyendo las organizaciones no gubernamentales, eh, en su gran mayoría condenan las medidas coercitivas unilaterales y apoyan la adopción de medidas de reparación para aquellos países afectados por estas medidas. Quisiera finalmente darle de nuevo la palabra a nuestro vicepresidente y líder de esta sesión para que intervenga de sus consideraciones y por supuesto clausure este importante evento que ha sido altamente interesante y altamente productivo. Distinguido embajador Am Ramadán, por favor. Thank you, Ambassador Valero. Uh, distinguished delegates, this brings us to the end of the biennial panel discussion on unilateral coercive measures and human rights. I wish to thank Ms. Peggy Hicks, who unfortunately had to leave moments ago due to another commitment, and His Excellency Ambassador Jorge Valero, as well as the four participants, four panelists, and all participants for their contributions. We will reconvene tomorrow morning at 10 a.m. for the annual discussion on the integration of a gender perspective throughout the work of the Human Rights Council and that of its mechanisms. I hereby declare closed the 10th meeting of the 36th session of the Human Rights Council.